Here's an interesting thing. I bought this pine honey about a couple of months ago in Lidl. It's part of their Eridanos range, which is kind of either Greek imports or Greek styled foods. They have a few things like that with different nationalities and it's just a chance for customers to try something which may or may not be authentically Greek or Italian or Polish or Swedish or whatever, but they do this kind of thing anyway. So I bought this pine honey. I featured this in my toasting fork video and I had done no research about what pine honey actually is. I had just assumed that this would be honey that was maybe infused with pine resin, like Retsina, basically the honey version of Retsina. But it turns out the truth is a little bit more interesting than that. So what this is, this is honey and it's made by bees. But instead of the bees collecting nectar from flowers, they collect honeydew from scale insects. Scale insects are bugs that live on all kinds of different plants, although in this case pine trees, and they're sap-sucking insects. Now the thing with sap-sucking insects is that they have to drink more sap than they can actually process, mostly with aphids and other sap-sucking insects like scale insects and so on. They suck the sap of plants, but the sap contains too much sugar and water for their requirements, because actually what they're really after is the minerals and the protein. Obviously some of the sugar for their energy sustenance, but by and large, they have to drink more sap than they can digest because they want the protein and the minerals out of it. So they excrete sugary sap, and that sugary sap is the basis of other food chains. For example, in some cases, molds and fungi grow on the sugary excretion from the aphids. In other cases, ants farm the aphids and harvest so-called honeydew, which is a rather euphemistic, pleasant name for aphid poop. The ants harvest this sugary stuff and use that for their sustenance. In this case, bees are harvesting the honeydew from scale insects that live on pine trees. And as a result, they're making this stuff, which is pine honey. Now it is legitimate honey, so it definitely is bee vomit, but it's bee vomit that's based on scale insect poop rather than flower juice. So that's interesting, isn't it? Anyway, I am gonna taste a bit of it today. I've already tasted some on my toasted crumpets, but those were toasted in front of the fire and had a kind of smoky flavor. So I'm gonna taste it again today, just on a toasted muffin with a bit of butter so that we can kind of hopefully appreciate the flavor in a more neutral setting. So I'm just gonna go toast a couple of muffins and we'll be right back. Right. I have in front of me two nicely, but not very evenly toasted muffins. Still nice and warm, warm enough to melt the butter, but not completely melted. I do like to have little islands of unmelted butter where possible. Okay, and then this honey. Now it looks like regular honey, it's quite, oh, now there is a kind of woody aroma to it. And it flows like regular honey. I would say it's a little bit more brownish side of yellow. I don't know if you'll better see that on the camera, but it's there's something about the color tone of it that is a little unusual. But to be honest, honey is quite a variable thing anyway. The different honeys are different colors and so forth. It's perhaps unwise to assume, to generalize from this sample and, and assume that there's something that's that distinctively different about pine honey. Anyway, gonna give that a little taste. Here we go. So it's lacking a lot of those kind of floral notes that you sometimes get with honey. So in that sense, it resembles golden syrup, which is a sugar product that uh, we use in baking in the UK. There is a very mild fruity ester aroma, like bananas or pears. I'm not really getting any woody notes from it, which is one of the things people say that you do get. Of course, I don't know how good quality or an example of pine honey this is. But what I'm doing here 
I'm just going to put the honey on my other slice of toast so I can lick the spoon. And we'll see what it's like when I taste it just on its own. Yeah, definitely that interesting, quite elusive fruity ester, slightly banana aroma, somewhere in the middle of the flavors. But generally, it's a bit less honey tasting than honey. I think you could tell me I was eating golden syrup here and I probably wouldn't question that. So there we go, pine honey, which is bee vomited scale insect poop. Um, not as floral as a typical flower based honey and for obvious reasons. Interesting subtle aromas, but actually generally it's quite neutral and quite just sugar syrupy. And so I'm not sure if that's a reason to buy it or a reason to avoid it. I tend to think of honey as something that you buy for the honey aroma. So this might be quite a good neutral cooking ingredient if you don't want an intense honey flavor in a cake, for example. But to me, that's kind of, that really is just golden syrup with a very, very slight fruitiness to it. Someone's appeared at my side. Oh, two paws, lovely. Interestingly neutral for something that's been entirely through the digestive system of one insect and then halfway through the digestive system of another insect. But anyway, that's pine honey. So what else can we say about pine honey? Well, one thing is that the packaging doesn't say anything about the origin of it, which is interesting. And the other thing I suppose is that I need to be a little bit careful about generalizing from this one sample. So if you've got experience of pine honey that is different to mine, do let me know about it in the comments. Here's today's DIY project for Shrimp Cottage. This wood burning stove needs a bit of maintenance. So what we need to do here, we've got cracked glass and this rope seal needs replacing. And actually there's a rope seal across here which has become flattened over time. That will need replacing as well. I've contacted the manufacturer, Stovax, and they gave me lots and lots of really helpful advice. And this is DIYable. So this is something uh, properly prepared amateur can do. So this doesn't require a qualified engineer to assist, although obviously you could do that. But yeah, Stovax were very, very helpful. And so I'm really, really happy to recommend Stovax, their customer support, considering I'm not the person that bought this stove. I've just inherited it with the house. Their customer support was excellent and they were really, really helpful. And they've told me exactly what I need to do. So I've bought the spares for this. We're gonna try and replace this glass and this rope seal today. So we should find that this door just lifts off. There we go. So I'm gonna take that outside, clean off the old rope, remove the glass. I think we might have a little bit of trouble undoing these screws, but we'll see how we get on. So first thing is going to be to remove this old rope and well you can see the adhesive has kind of degraded a little bit so that came away really nice and easy. We will dispose of that and then I just need to scrape out the old adhesive. Obviously not a job for the best screwdriver. Now we need to see if we can get these screws undone that are holding the glass. Right, that one's not too bad. That one came up nice and easy. That one's stuck. That one's coming undone okay. Also stuck. Right, so, gotta be careful here because we could just end up grinding the screw head out as we try and remove it. So I'm going to give them a little tap with an impact driver. Now this is where it could all go horribly wrong because this is cast iron and obviously cast iron's a bit brittle. So I need to be a bit careful with the impact driver. I'm only going to give it a little tap just to see if that will loosen it. If not, we'll, we might have to drill it out. Yeah, that's moving. That's good. 
There it goes. So yeah, I wouldn't whack that with a big heavy hammer, but repeated gentle tapping with the impact driver. All this is is a, a screwdriver, which when you bang it, it has a slight twisting action. So as you tap it, it not only drives the bit down into the slot, but it gives it a little twist as well. Okay, so a rotary abrasive brush made of plastic with little bits of grit or something in it to give it a bit more abrasive power. Now I've been around with the rotary brush, but I'm just gonna give it a little scrub right down in there with a hand brush and you can see more material is coming out so it's worth doing that this really needs to be very clean well very free of loose bits quite important to get all the loose stuff out before we put the new adhesive in replacement glass obviously not just any old bit of glass this is the official glass from the manufacturer just offer that up make sure it's going to fit it's a little bit of a wobble on that glass which is interesting i'll just check there's nothing i'll just give it a brush into that corner just to make sure there's nothing up that end yeah there was a bit of corrosion there that i missed and maybe down in that corner as well but I suspect that's probably just an imperfection in the way the casting is made. Obviously it's cast iron, it will shift a little bit as it cools. Oh, that's a bit better actually. Yeah, still a little bit of a wobble, so high spots here and here. But the gasket will allow for some of that. What I should get here is like a three millimeter rope that goes in there, but the new stuff is this. So I think what I'm gonna have to do here is take off this adhesive backing. Right, I think I'll do this in two operations. I will do a piece across there and then another piece that goes across the top. So I'm going to cut that to size there. That length. And tuck that under this seal here. And it is fraying a little bit, but once the glass is in there, the glass will hold this all in place. In fact, what I'm going to do is stick it down to that side. Yeah, that's it. Stick it down to that side and then push it under. Looking good. Okay, so I don't know if you can see that actually. So it's flush with this edge of the metal and I've just pushed it under there. The other piece I need to try and curve it round. So this is going to go onto here and I just need to fit it around like this. I'm doing really is just making sure that the edge is stuck down to the edge to there like that okay let's trim that off again tiny bit of overlap because this stuff's soft so that's a new gasket seal and we'll just push it down into the groove there that is underlying that this is not the official spare this is the spare for the more modern version of this stove i've got the mark one this is the seal for the mark two but i had conversations with various engineers and qualified persons and they've told me that we can do this so there we go right and then we'll just get the glass on there and in place and there is a little bit of an overlap there but i think we're okay 
what I'm doing now is just applying a little piece of that glass fibre tape onto the bottom of these clips so that what's gripping the glass is the tape, not the metal. Not sure it's strictly necessary to do this, in fact it probably isn't, but I'm a bit more comfortable with the glass tape gripping the glass, not the metal. And I'm not doing up any of these screws to the tightest I can go, I'm just going to nip them. I don't want to actually screw this so tight that it gets jammed again. So just kind of comfortably tight is good. And we'll just now tighten those down. That one, then this one, then that one, then that one. And I'm not going to go any tighter than that. It's just done up. Let's have a look at that from the front. There's a little bit of tape protruding just there. So what I might just do is just tuck that back under. Now I just need to do the perimeter rope seal. And I am going to just go round again with the wire brush. Well, you can see that was worth doing. Because every time I go round, some more stuff is coming off. So just a case of going round there until no more comes off. So that's the glass done. Now the door rope. And this rope seal goes around the edge here like this. So I need to measure up. We have the joint here at the bottom. And I'll just offer up the rope all the way around. It does have a little bit of stretch in it, so that gives us a bit of scope for manoeuvring. Okay. And it needs to be taped against fraying. So it's got tape around one piece there already. So I'm going to apply the tape around the other end. They've given us a little bit of this ceramic tape, I think it is. So just put that around the part where it's going to join, which is right there. Tape first. then cut. If you cut first you could end up with it fraying while you're trying to tape it. I think just for belt and braces I'm going to put another piece of tape around this end because that little narrow piece of tape there that was as supplied is not that great. So we'll just put an extra piece around there like that. Next, rope seal adhesive. So we just need to squirt some of this generously around the perimeter. I'm going to need more than this, so I might go around again. And obviously, you need to make sure. All of the little gaps are filled. Okay, not the neatest job, but we get to cover it all up. So now that rope seal goes into the groove. Just push it down so it makes contact with that adhesive all the way around, kind of pinch it down into place. Some of it will soak up into the rope and that's fine. That's what will part of what will create the bond. Now we haven't got enough rope, but that's fine because what we're gonna do is just give it a little stretch along here. A little stretch along there. And then get it back to the dimension that I originally measured, which is there. So there we go. A the stretch there. The two ends butt together nicely. Get it down into the seal, into the door. Oops. 
seating nicely into the groove. Now give that a press down all the way around. Making a mess of my fingers, we need to have a clean up in a minute. Just making sure it's engaged with the adhesive at all points. Looking pretty good. Okay, and now I've just got to leave that for half an hour. Nearly forgot this, this stove also needs a bit of rope across the middle channel there. Uh, the mid door channel so I'm going to glue a piece in there same procedure though we'll just cut the rope to length tape off the ends glue it in place okay now just testing a bit of the glue where it ran over I can see that that's now gone off that's not sticky anymore so now we need to get the door back on which shouldn't be that hard to do okay so line up those pins that's the trick there we go so the door's back seated on its hinge and now just need to press that firmly closed and lock it just to compress that rope before we light a fire. Especially this piece here which is going to have to be squished against this bar. So. It's quite tight at the moment. That handle doesn't turn any more than that. On the newer models of this stove, that's adjustable. On this one, it's not. Right, so we'll leave that for another hour to let that sort of compress into place. And then we need to light a fire, which is gonna bake this glue and finish curing it. Well, the moment of truth, a little bit of that cardboard and a fire lighter. These are just wood straw based fire lighters. Some thin stuff, some slightly thicker stuff, and a match. Now I need to leave that open just until it catches. Okay, the kindling's caught nicely, so I just put a slightly bigger piece on top. And now we'll get the door shut, but we'll leave the vent and the damper open. So when that warms up and bakes the glue, that's going to set the glue completely and that should keep everything completely sealed. So there we go. Jobs are good, I'd say. So how many times in my foraging videos have you heard me say the words, you can't dig that up without the landowner's permission? And I've not been able to th harvest things like dandelion roots or Solomon seal or burdock because I couldn't dig it up because it wasn't my land. That is no longer the case. I now have a piece of woodland of my own. And so the other day when I was out walking, I just picked a few of these. And these are burdock seed heads. So I'm just gonna see what they're like. Yeah, so there are the seeds inside. These are burdock seeds. And so I'm gonna plant some burdock seeds on my own land now. And hopefully when these plants grow, well, for one thing, we'll leave some of them be because it's a nice native plant. It's good for the bees and all sorts of stuff like that. But also, I will have the opportunity to harvest burdock stems and burdock roots, which are edible and delicious. I'm not going to plant these in pots. I could plant them in pots and seed trays and raise them properly. But actually, what I'm going to do, I've got plenty of seeds here. I'm just going to scatter them in the place I would like them to grow and we'll wait and see what happens gosh now these little sticky burrs are actually hooking into my skin i need to be a little bit careful here that it doesn't work its way into my skin and hurt me anyway so that's my burdock seeds i've separated some of them i'm going to throw this lot on the soil and we will see what comes up in spring now burdock likes kind of dappled shade and wood edges so i think this is probably not a bad place to start it off and we'll see what happens so i'm just going to scatter the seeds all over this area here and hopefully well some burdock plants come up there so we'll come back here in springtime see if anything's coming up it's time once again for the comment positivity section and this is where I'm just going to pick out a handful of comments that either really uplifted me or encouraged me or I found very positive or that asked interesting questions that need to be addressed. 
So reading glasses on and let us proceed. So I'd just like to thank everyone who really made positive comments over the Christmas period and about the recent house move and other stuff like that. There's actually been an overwhelming number of really positive, lovely comments just recently. I have read as many of them as I can. I think I might have got them all, but I'm, I'm just really glad that you commented. I obviously haven't got room to feature all of your lovely comments on the screen right now, but they did make a difference. And I'm mentioning this really not because I want to bask in your fawning adoration, although that is nice, but really because I wanted to point out that you have a power. In making these positive comments, you uplifted my mood. You have the power to positively affect other people's mental health in the world. And I think that's an amazing thing to do. And so I just really wanted to encourage people who've made positive comments in the last month, well, in, in, ever on the channel. You have the power to change the world in tiny but good and positive ways. In particular, just recently, there's been quite a lot of people saying nice things about the variety of topics that I cover on this channel. And thanks to everyone who commented to that effect. Not just because you said something nice, but because you get it. This channel still isn't going to knuckle down and focus on one topic, because I, what I do here is the stuff that interests me. Of course, some of it won't be for everyone, and some of it, and for some people, none of it is for them at all, and that's fine. But I intend to keep on making videos about stuff that interests me as long as I'm able to keep going, because that is the force that drives me. On a related note, a few people asked, do I worry when I publish a video and it doesn't get very many views? Uh, generally, no, I don't, actually, because I, what I'm doing here is what I want to do. And a lot of my videos have a kind of slow burn thing anyway, actually, where, yeah, they don't have any kind of viral peak. But over months and years sometimes, they just do this steady slow burn where people pick them up. Sometimes they have a little spike way, way later after publication when people pick them up and they get circulated on social media or something like that. So in terms of view count, I am delighted that this channel has grown to the point where it pays my bills, but I'm still making videos because I want to. I, about the things I want to, about the topics I want to, and so it's possible that one day I will cover a topic that I'm the only person interested in. So next, a whole load of questions about my Slaughter Valley public information films, which are published as YouTube shorts. People asking where did I get the footage, is it an ARG, and commenting on similarities to other works in the same genre. So I've put together a short segment about Slaughter Valley, both from the kind of in-universe perspective and from the behind-the-scenes production angle. Now, I realise that last part, the production angle, might be a bit spoilery for some people, so I've made it the last piece in this video. So if you're interested in avoiding spoilers on Slaughter Valley, when you hit that spoiler alert, there's nothing else in the video to miss. Anyway, here we go with a kind of documentary about Slaughter Valley. What is Slaughter Valley? Okay, first the in-universe explanation. Slaughter Valley is an administrative district, probably in England, named after the River Slaughter that runs through it. It encompasses a number of towns and small villages, as well as possibly a city. One interesting fact is that the Slaughter Valley shares a border with every other county in England. For this reason, it's possible for people to accidentally stray into it from almost anywhere, although it's considerably harder to get out again. I would try to show you this on a map, but sadly that's not possible because as a location it doesn't conform to any normal geometric, geological, spatial or cartographic principles. The majority of Slaughter Valley's population is employed in local political or other administrative functions in order to try to be in control of one another. In general, everyone is a victim of someone else's abuse or misuse of power. And so everyone has sought power that they can themselves misuse out of a sense of retribution. Most policies and activities in Slaughter Valley are motivated by some degree of spite. Slaughter Valley is plagued by a near continual stream of incidents, some of which cannot be discussed, others pertain to incursion of beings or forces which are not like the things experienced by other places in the world, and as a result of all of the above, there is a requirement for a near continual stream of informational films to warn or control the populace, or just to inform them of the thing they should be frightened about today. In our own reality, however, and spoilers ahead, here's how I make these videos. It all started with a little skit based on a scammer replying to me to say goodbye to us. I just took that weird phrase and invented a sort of tradition around it. Then I started expanding it into a bigger picture. 
The reality of Slaughter Valley is fluid and never clearly stated. It's perennially unclear whether there really are supernatural and metaphysical things happening there, or if these things are just lies being told for some other purpose or no purpose at all. There may be monsters under the bed, or there may only be stories about monsters under the bed. Or the stories about monsters under the bed might just be a smokescreen to obscure the real truth about the monsters under the bed. For this reason, any contradiction in the narrative could be there for any reason. Today's truth, here, may not conform to tomorrow's truth just over there. Besides, truth is not very high on everyone's agenda in Slaughter Valley. Influences for this series are diverse. Those that I can consciously recall include George Orwell's 1984, Monty Python, Peter Serafinowicz, and in particular, Poison Suckets, League of Gentlemen, we didn't burn him, and Scarfuck, but really I'm playing to a kind of broader genre that I believe people call analogue horror. Viewers often mention other works, such as Night Vale, SCP, and We Happy Few, which are apparently in the same genre. Obviously I've heard of these now, but I'm actually avoiding consumption of any other materials in this genre because I want to keep my own writing as original as possible. I feel like it's way too easy to accidentally plagiarise if I was to watch too much of other people's stuff now. People looking for some sort of parable or analogy in all of this will be disappointed. This isn't about real-world politics or sociology or anything, except by complete accident. I'm not trying to make a point here. Vocals are just recorded, then put through a compression filter, with a little bit of analogue crackle and noise added. I do affect a slightly different mode of speaking when I record these, to try to give them that authoritative information film sort of feel. Footage typically comes from free stock video sites, primarily Pexels. The nature of the free stock footage found there is very apt for this sort of work. Whilst Pexels contains a mountain of free, high quality footage, a great deal of it is not very useful for general purpose and a lot of it is reasonably absurd in its content. I think this arises from two factors. Firstly, the site is supported by ads and embedded search results that direct the user to paid stock footage. Those ads wouldn't work so well if the free content just satisfied the search criteria. And secondly, it is a platform for up-and-coming artists to showcase their work, and so a good number of them appear to be consciously trying to be arty and quirky. Sometimes, in fact, the inspiration for an episode comes in part from the stock footage itself, I can't remember what I was searching for when I found various clips of people holding and caressing spherical objects. The story came after the footage in that particular case. But even a reasonably mundane piece of stock footage can be made to look more disturbing by tight cropping to strip out all the context, along with converting to high contrast monochrome, a little bit of added film damage and camera shake to emulate a worn old film that's been transferred to video. So that's about all I can say about Slaughter Valley at this point, and that's the end of this episode of Random Stuff. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.